by the way, if you want to know more about hemolysis, uh, Miruna Popa, P-O-P-A, she's going to present on the behalf of four different centers the first uh, multicentric uh, study on that uh, subject. Uh, it's 2.30, the uh, immoderated um, poster session today. So um, it's perhaps useless to say, but um, we have to, uh, I think, uh, keep thinking as PFA, as a different energy as um, what we have been used in the past, because there are plenty of parameters that are going to impact both the safety and the efficacy. And it's the uh, merit of the engineers who have been working on this energy so far with different solutions to, you know, fine-tune um, um, as best as possible um, the waveform um, to have the uh, more successful outcome. And I uh, still think that we don't understand um, fully why sales are dying. So, yes, we are uh, opening uh, irreversible pores in the cell membrane, and they may die out of that. This is acute. But there is also a delayed effect with apoptosis that we don't um, probably clearly uh, understand or um, recognize at present time. The good thing about it is that it, um, the, the efficacy is maintained in trabeculated areas. And this is very important because, in my opinion, RF is doing a poor job in those areas. Uh, in some cases it works, in, in some cases it's a nightmare. So there might be some interest here. Um, and I'd like to thank um, Medtronic and Afira uh, well, first of all, for getting married, I think it's a very good idea, and con congratulations on that, and also for um, having me involved in my center, involved from the early days of AFIRA. Um, so th this is um, uh, 2017 at Lyric in Bordeaux, uh, where we um, did uh, some um, animal uh, cases, and then I had a chance to um, uh, be invited doing uh, some um, um, patient's case in Prague and then we did more in Bordeaux. So thank you to uh, my uh, friends in Prague as well. And um, then uh, you have seen some of these uh, reports already uh, with this um, original technology that toggles between RF and uh, PF and uh, that I think is very interesting. And like uh, before with um, the uh, competition, it takes a little bit of time to fine-tune the waveform and get the uh, optimal results, and this is where they are now with a durability when it comes to PVI that is 96% um, per vein and 90% per patient, which is remarkable. The other interesting and unique, I think, um, aspect is that the, the catheter is very original, and the design is um, giving you a... a um, contact and a, a management of the interface with the tissue that is absolutely unique and it's kind of anchoring in the tissue with an amazing stability. It was recognized by the way um, in the early days in animal experiments. We thought, wow, this is, this is different. Um, and, and then um, you have these um, um, micro electrodes on the latest itself that are um, used of course to record um, very clear electrograms, but also you see the highlight with the white points. Um, uh, I don't know. Yeah, th this is uh, this is it. These this, um, uh, white uh, highlighted in white electrodes are in fact in contact, as judged by uh, local impedance that is measured be between the microelectrodes and the uh, internal reference um, in the catheter. And then you have some further refinements where. Um, it happens that when delivering PF, there is a slight increase in temperature that is picked up by the uh, sensors on the electrodes. It's by one or two degrees C, but it's enough to um, identify that there is very likely a lesion that has been formed. And so the distance between the hot electrodes is then calculated by the system to give, to give, to give you some idea of the contiguity of the lesions. And we, when, when you have it, then the blue line disappears. It's pretty convenient. So this is a uh, patient we recently did in Bodo with the system. Green tags means PF. We did uh, a roof line in addition to the um, pulmonary veins, and you see the remapping with the system, which clearly shows the block at the roof. It's pretty convenient. And um, you can also note that, yes, there is a lesion, but it's not take, taking out 
the entire Parsi wall. And in my opinion, it matters because, again, when it comes to persistent AF, the, the best ablation strategy is the one that restores durable sinus rhythm at the least tissue cost. And I think this is under-recognized, particularly now that with PF, we have uh, pretty easily the opportunity to wipe out entirely the left atrium. That is not desirable, and that's the, um, in my opinion, the biggest uh, concern um, I have. It's not about the energy itself, but the safety relates to us and what we do with the tool, in my opinion. So um, we also did in that patient a uh, mitral isthmus line, uh, which is blocked, as you can see, and you have this uh, blue arrow here that is uh, representing the uh, vector of activation front that um, proceeds towards the line, demonstrating that it's uh, blocked. And I think this design is um, better suited for linear lesions as compared to um, the uh, FAPOS technology that I've been working a lot with and that I, I still use a lot and I like it a lot, but really the design is better suited for just the veins as compared to the Sphere 9, which can do both the veins and the lines. So for my persistent AF cases, I, I wish I had enough catheters to do uh, all of them with the Sphere 9. Thank you. <laughs> um, but, but again, the, the concern I have is that, yes, yes, you can do it with, with this flower configuration, but look at what is left of the left atrium. That's really not much. Um, now, I, I think this system has also a major role to play in VT ablation. Um, so these are experimental work that have been done um, both by Elad Hunter and Vivek Reddy mostly and, and Jacob Korath. And it appears that uh, with this system that has been developed for atrial lesions, you can get decent um, ventricular lesions. And as always, when it comes to um, pulse field ablation, the repetition of the lesions is giving you uh, bigger lesions and more depth, which might be um, uh, important, of course, when it comes to VT. And um, interestingly enough, um, they, they also have demonstrated, and I think this is really interesting, that you can, if you apply um, PF on top of an old or ma matured RF lesion, you can still exceed that lesion. And this is interesting because maybe it will behave the same uh, in, in um, uh, the presence of a scar in the ventricle of our patients or in the atrium of our patients. It does exist. Um, and uh, this is encouraging because um, the most um, important limiting factor in VT ablation, in my opinion, at present time, is the ablation component. I think mapping were very good. Image integration um, helps a lot, but uh, the, the um, ablation part of it is um, suboptimal with point-by-point uh, point RF. And these this, uh, um, tools are going to uh, be super helpful. And you see that in those animal experiments, uh, you can get up to almost nine millimeters depth by giving four deliveries at the same site. It's quite remarkable with a system that has not been optimized for ventricular lesions, in my opinion. And if you look here, you have even uh, greater depth with RF. And this is probably um, one area where RF with this system could be used. I mean, those patients with preserved LV wall thickness and potentially those difficult um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or intramural scar that we can reach otherwise, uh, um, it could be of interest and it's significantly more depth as compared to the SDSF um, uh, lesions. And that's one of the um, uh, last cases we did um, when it comes to VT ablation in Bordeaux with the system. Uh, Fred Sacher did that procedure. It's a patient with a laminopathy. And um, with no surprise, he's, he has a, a quite extensive basal and septal substrate that is here depicted by um, image integration with uh, in our technology um, from an MRI that has been reconstructed. And um, so that was helpful uh, uh, along with the uh, mapping to um, uh, decide on the ablation strategy. It was a difficult case. It was the third attempt, two previous failed attempt. And um, so um, Fred did use some RF at some point of time, 
couldn't terminate that, that VT nicely. And so at the end of the day, it, it was uh, mostly using PF on both sides of the septum that uh, finally um, um, make the uh, arrhythmia non-inducible. And interestingly enough, and for the first, uh, for, for, for the first time of, of this patient, he has been uh, with no recurrent VT for um, uh, three months now. So very encouraging. And the way I see the future is that, um, you know, we, we can probably, with this type of system, have VT ablation in the context of post-myocardial infarction as simple as PVI. What I mean is that um, with advanced image reconstruction, you get a very good idea of where the substrate is. So this is a uh, um, pretty large inferior uh, myocardial infarction. And we have contoured in white the areas of um, probably um, pretty dense scar. This is from wall thickness at uh, CT scan. And in between, you have the uh, channels that the arrhythmia may use. So with um, registration of this type of, of uh, uh, information, you can straight away take your ablation catheter, and it has the perfect size to transect the um, CD channel or the VT isthmus. And with this information, you can also favor the area that is the most vulnerable in the isthmus, which is where the wall thickness is the least. So this would be harder. And typically, with conventional approaches, we tend to target more the entrance or the exit of the channel where the wall thickness is uh, more important, and therefore the likelihood for having a durable lesion is probably less. Finally, I'd like to um, show you this case uh, that we did a few years ago where we had, uh, after AF ablation, a um, re-entrance circuit through the roof. I think it's pretty clear here. And um, some um, probably um, collision around uh, the lateral LA. And um, so here um, you see that, that um, uh, collision here in the ridge between the um, left appendage and the left veins. But after shaving that ridge, you can see now that there, there is a consistent um, activation. And in fact, the patient had a double loop reentry. And why am I making that point? Well, because in some patients, um, the uh, both structures are very close to each other. And then the system likes to take, to eliminate, not to consider any internal point. So it's looking as a, a reconstruction for a sphere, taking on, on, only into account for the map the points that would be in this region. Um, and those points, they are um, considering the um, far field signal from the appendage for the activation map. And this is where there is a problem. And I think that by doing so, you miss this, this interesting signal that are deeper in the um, uh, reconstructed um, um, electroanatomic uh, map. And um, uh, you miss the opportunity to um, um, understand what is going on. Um, and uh, it may be very misleading, but with the vein mode that the Sphere 9 and, and the Afrika system have, has bring, um, you, you, you probably are going to uh, avoid that pitfall if you use the vein mode, which is that you help the system understanding where the ridge is um, anatomically located. The system do it partly automatically, partly based on your recommendation. Uh, I find it very useful and interesting. And one last thing is this um, um, possible advantage of using sublethal dose of PF just to confirm the site of interest, the site of origin, or the critical um, isthmus um, site for a given arrhythmia. Finally, um, I had a chance to use this uh, Sphere 360 by the same company. It's amazingly effective, super easy to use, and it isolates the veins in um, no time. So Vivek uh, Reddy, who has the uh, um, uh, biggest experience, will present on the uh, late-breaking trial right after this session. Um, you're welcome to attend, of course. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pierre, for this wonderful presentation. Are there questions? 
I, I found it very important, and you don't, that, you don't hear that too often, especially if we do PFA with, you know, other catheter designs, to be careful, even, especially in small atria, not to extensively ablate, even to large antral areas, because uh, you might face stiff left atrium, and these people are really sick people. So I think that was a very important point. Thank you. I think it's really important to preserve as much as possible the atrial function and the cardiac function after ablation. And when you, when you, when you have these um, kind of tools that are extremely powerful, you may be tempted because the arrhythmia is still there to uh, keep ablating without really understanding what is going on. I think that's a pitfall we uh, should uh, um, be aware of. And Milani? I have another question. Uh, and one point, I think uh, we, we in the last three decades, we have, whether thermal RF or cryo, we have seen a lot of catheters and energy, other energy sources come and go, but I think uh, PFA will stay. What do you think in the future? Um, I think PFA will probably stay. I, uh, more importantly, it's hard to predict what the future will be, of course. But the near future, in my opinion, is going to be an explosion of PFA cases. And so I understand your points. Uh, um, that is very well taken, that the risk for severe complications with thermal energies is low. But if I were a patient, and if I had an alternative for no risk, I would choose that over a small risk. That's my feeling. And I have a low threshold as a personal um, standpoint. You know, I have a low threshold for um, the, 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 the risk for iatrogenic complications. Um, so this is why I love BFA so much. Uh, thank you for this excellent presentation. I have a question, and um, I don't know if there's any knowledge about it, but when we look at thermal lesions, right, we know that when we add lesions that, or we prolong the application, that we have the conduction um, and the warmth of the lesion goes through the tissue. But here we have a very short field with PFA. But still you show that when we stack the lesions, we get a deeper lesion. And what's the pathophysiology behind it? Does it have something with changing the resistivity of the tissue, or is it Probably. the targeting of the, the cell membranes? Um, I, I don't think it's fully understood, but I think it's what you said. It's a, a kind of a sensitivation of, of the tissue, probably through some impedance change. Um, maybe not limited to that. Uh, it's kind of unclear why really cells are dying and what makes the uh, depth in addition to that. Thank you. And I have... Another question? Is that okay? okay. Um, so you just showed it at the end of your um, presentation, the reversible uh, electroporation. And um, it also has been shown at the PFA Summit. And what I was wondering is, is that now a good sign or not that we yeah. have a little tiny bit of a lesion? Um, yeah, so they, they studied that, uh, Vivek and his colleagues. In the, uh, it's really associated to no lesion or, or one millimeter. So... I don't know if it's good, uh, but it's interesting. I mean, it, it deserves uh, probably further uh, investigations.